All right. Um, first of all, thanks, thanks for the invitation. Um, and as, uh, as we've heard, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Neolithic transition. But first, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, exciting conference and to, to Jerusalem. Um, this is my second time in Israel, and I'm going to take the advice of drinking a lot of water. I'm coming from, from Stockholm. It was 8 degrees Celsius the other day. Uh, it's actually a nice time in Sweden. It's May, it's blooming, and it's, it's green. Um, so we usually think of 8 degrees as quite okay. Today is a beautiful day. Um, also, I arrived, and my computer arrived, but my luggage didn't arrive, so I have some issues. But uh, I'm here, so I'm happy, happy to at least give this talk today. Uh, my idea is here to, is to talk a little bit about the genomic footprints uh, of the Neolithic transition. Uh, and I'm going to start by giving you some, some background from uh, very little from archaeology. Some, I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a population geneticist. I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor from Luca Cavalli-Swarza's work in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and then I'm going to look into some of the most recent uh, developments of looking into modern day genetic variation, the genomic uh, patterns that we're seeing uh, across uh, Europe in particular, and just see how far can we go if we just work with modern day uh, genetic variation. Uh, then I'll end that session and, and come to uh, where my key point is that I think we actually can learn a lot more if we start looking into the DNA of the ancient individuals who were actually part of this Neolithic transition. I've cut out most of these things that I usually give uh, in this, this type of talk, but I have two points that are more technical or kind of methods oriented um, that I'll try to emphasize. And then I'll come to actually the meat uh, of this talk. So I'll talk about the Neolithic transition. There's going to be a lot of focus on Scandinavia, and you have to bear with me for that. Um, there's many reasons uh, DNA preserves quite well in Scandinavia because it's cold. Um, but I'll, I'll argue that um, some of the patterns that we're seeing in Scandinavia are actually general for uh, at least the, the European continent, uh, but probably for many of these types of transitions. And I'll extend the idea beyond Scandinavia towards the end, uh, and then I'll try to summarize what I've been saying a few in one slide. So if we start by looking into uh, what archaeologists have been finding and saying, um, well, it's quite clear now that some perhaps 10, 12,000 years ago, um, the Neolithic invention or the start of farming uh, arose somewhere in the, the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. And it spread um, across the European continent to the north and to the west in a fairly, at least according to population geneticists, uh, a very rapid manner, um, ending up in Scandinavia perhaps 6,000 years ago and perhaps in, in uh, Iberia seven or 8,000 uh, years ago. So this, this transition, at least according to, to many archaeologists in the last couple of decades, they've argued that this transition is a spread of ideas. It's the same people who are living there from prior to the introduction of the Neolithic. It's the same groups of hunter-gatherers who just learn uh, in one way or another that uh, they can actually do farming and live in a different way. So that's been the, the ruling theory for quite some time. Um, as I said, I'm going to have a lot of focus on Scandinavia, so let's just get that introduced right away. So why study Scandinavia? Well, I said DNA is well preserved. So usually every second bone we try, we actually have decent amounts of DNA in them. I'm sure it's very different if you go to a hot area like here, um, where there's much less uh, or worse conditions for DNA preservation. Uh, another feature is that we're really at the fringe of the Neolithic expansion. So 5,000 years ago, you have two groups of people, um, one group, the Pitted ware culture, here highlighted in blue in the coasts of Sweden. Um, they're living at the same time as, as another group of people who are practicing farming. So they're living uh, for about a thousand years side by side um, and in perhaps not harmony, but it's, leads, it's not uh, in direct warfare or anything like that. Um, there's many differences, and, and these differences are, can be generalized to the greater European or Eurasian continent. Um, and some generalities, I, I will, we can extend some of the, the features that I'm explaining for these two different groups in Scandinavia. So, for example, uh, there's different animal remains associated with, um, with the two groups, the hunter-gatherers and farmers, for example. Uh, the 
the farmers, they have domesticated animal remains associated with them. They have plant material, domesticated plant material associated with the grave goods. Uh, whereas uh, the hunter-gatherers typically have, like, in these particular groups, have seal bones. They're seal hunters. So there's lots of seal bones as associated uh, with these uh, graves. There's also different levels of, uh, of way of life. They've eaten different things. That can be seen from isotope studies, where you actually can see what type of food uh, these individuals have been eating in the, in the last couple of years of their life. Um, the traditional marker between, from, from an archaeological point of view, uh, are pottery. And pottery has even given the names of these groups. So here's an example of pitted ware culture pottery. Uh, here's another funnel beaker pottery, which has given the name for the funnel beaker culture. So, so this pottery has been extremely important to, for archaeologists to kind of uh, associate human remains with different cultures. But there's other things, uh, burial practices, for example, in some parts, uh, the farmer groups build these big megaliths that are still standing in uh, the north of Europe and the west of Europe, whereas the hunter-gatherers, they use kind of flatbed graves. So they bury their dead just into the ground, straight down. Okay, so Kavali Svorza and colleagues uh, started looking into classical genetic markers like the blood groups and HLA and, and a handful of other of these types of markers. Uh, and they typed them in modern-day people living uh, across Europe. Um, and they took these frequencies, made principal component analysis of the, these frequencies for these handful of markers, um, took those principal, the first principal component loadings and, loadings and made regressions of that. And in the end, they came to what was presented as this, as synthetic maps. And, and what they found was a gradient from the southeast to the northwest, like this. Uh, and Cavalli Sforza, who's a very well-educated man, uh, he made the interpretation here that, well, this is actually an indication that migration was the driving force of the Neolithic Revolution, that uh, it was people from the Middle East who replaced the local hunter-gatherers who were living in other parts of Europe uh, as the Neolithic transition moved on. Uh, but more recently, um, others have shown, including John Levambre and colleague, uh, and Matthew Stevens, uh, they've shown that if you just take, uh, for say, a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional space, and you simulate realistic amounts of data, and you have symmetric migration between these little dots representing populations, so there's no um, range expansion or any directional migration in any direction, you actually expect to see a gradient in principal component number one perfectly fitting with what Cavalier Swartz and colleagues found. So you can't really take those data that they presented uh, and interpret them as, as a range expansion, that there's a replacement of people um, uh, connected to the Neolithic Revolution. So if we jump forward uh, into what we can see now when we have genomic type of data, Here's a, f a famous now picture from John Vambers, another John Vambers study, where they looked into some 300,000 markers from people of, of Europe. Uh, and they typed these three end markers and they summarized it in two dimensions using principal component analysis, uh, trying then to capture the two greatest, uh, the strongest patterns of variation uh, in this data. And what they found to their actual surprise when they presented this first uh, is that you have, if you just plot these two first principal components, and each little dot here represents an individual sample from a particular country where, who has his or her uh, four grandparents from that particular same country. Uh, you actually see that this, we can call it a genetic map, um, very well represents a geographic map of Europe. You have individuals from Portugal, Spain in the lower left corner here, individuals from France, Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland. So you can see that quite a lot of the genetic information is correlated with the uh, geographic information. So what does this mean? Well, one uh, generalization or one interpretation uh, that we can say is that people have tended to have children with other people who live close by geographically. That's perhaps not a very surprising find. That's what humans do. Um, but this is actually good news when we start digging into um, trying to f understand um, the, the impact of the Neolithic Revolution. And first of all, if you just look at this pattern, it doesn't really uh, bode well for Kavali Svorza's ideas. 
it doesn't look like there's a strong gradient uh, from the south to the north. So perhaps all what we need is some type of model like this, an isolation by distance model, where uh, there's migration between a lot of different themes across this geographic landscape, but there's no directional migration or a replacement from one end to another. But there are other patterns. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so th there are other patterns that you can actually look into. Uh, and if you look into um, genetic diversity per se, you see that, uh, and you should just look at these numbers here, uh, at the southern end of Europe, these numbers are higher than if you compare to the northern ends. So these are measures of genetic diversity, haplotype genetic diversity. And there's actually a pattern that looks somewhat similar to what Cavalli's Forza and colleagues said, that there's more diversity in the south and less in the north. There is some sort of gradient from the south to the north. So this is perhaps looking more in the direction of a range expansion or a replacement uh, of people. And this is probably as far as I think we can come when we look at genomic data from modern day individuals. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult looking at people who live today uh, in Europe to try to figure out what happened in the past without any idea of the DNA of the people who were part of this Neolithic transition. And I think in 2008 or so, or nine, uh, we'd come to the end of what can be done uh, with this type of data. Luckily, um, at this time, uh, it's been quite clear that the ancient DNA field is, is becoming mature, and we can actually handle ancient DNA from anatomically modern humans, not only from Neanderthals, who are genetically to some degree distinct from, from us, um, and we can actually work with DNA from, from basically the same individuals as ourselves or our predecessors. So here's just a list of things that we've been working on. There's lots of other people who have done great work in trying to put uh, the field of ancient DNA into a more mature perspective. So we've been working on uh, some ideas of how to actually get rid of contamination and to use ancient DNA damages in a quantitative way to clean off very badly contaminated samples. Uh, we've been working on ideas of how to work with perhaps not high coverage sequence data when you actually have lower uh, coverage sequence data when the DNA is not super well preserved. And there's other challenges like we don't really have as many samples as what I presented for the modern day times. Uh, and there's other things that are interesting, finding out the sex of some, some individuals and family relationships. So what's the motivation of working with the ancient material uh, in itself? Well, personally, I think it's, it's actually, we're studying the actual individuals that we're interested in. We're not studying modern day people living today, trying to make inferences about what happened five, 10, 15,000 years ago. Second, uh, I'll show you one example, and I'm quite convinced about this, that there's a lot of uh, more or greater possibilities of making better inferences about what happened in the past if we actually have access to this time serial data or the uh, third dimension. But perhaps uh, maybe the the overarching or more interesting track is that if you think that you want to track evolution over time, you want to do that in bacteria, you want to do it in, in yeast or some small organism where you can actually follow a number of generations forward in time. But when you actually have access to DNA from historical samples, you can do this for a species like humans. And that's what we could consider a time capsule. Or that's something that we couldn't even imagine 10, 15, 20 years ago that we would be able to track evolution in a direct manner in humans, for example. <coughs> Let me just show you one example of contamination. Um, so here's, here's a study that we did uh, a year ago, where we took one ancient individual, it doesn't matter who it is, but it's, its genetic signature uh, puts it on a two-dimensional representation of modern day people from Europe uh, and, and the Levant over here. And we can take this ancient material and we can put on artificial modern day contamination into it. So we're bioinformatically contaminating our sample post sequencing the actual ancient DNA. Um, so we're adding 20, 50, 90% contamination from a modern day French individual. And as you see, if we make uh, an interpretation of that contaminated pool and plot it on a PCA map, for example, we quite soon uh, get the signal where this contaminated individual is genetically similar to modern day French individuals. Not surprising because 90% of its genome is coming from modern day French. But if we use uh, a nuisance or what was also for a long time known as a nuisance 
uh, in ancient DNA, uh, there's a degradation of the, uh, of the basis. There's a deamination process where Ts turn into Cs, and particularly at the end of the sequences. So we can take out those sequences that have this particular pattern and use it as a, as a time stamp to say that these are proper ancient DNA uh, and not contaminating the signals. And we can clean off those um, DNA fragments that are contaminants and we can live with up to even 90% contamination and still get the same type of signal as we would if we had uncontaminated samples. So this is just a, a way of handling contamination post molecular lab processing, where bioinformatically basically. And it's just a good way of making confirmations of what we're doing makes sense even for, for highly contaminated samples. Uh, another interesting or good uh, tool is that uh, humans have one mitochondria inherited from their mother and you're only supposed to have one mitochondrial type uh, in your cells. And if you actually find two mitochondrial types, well, that's a very strong indication on that there's contamination. So these types of things can also be used. Here you see the consensus allele and here you see the deviant allele for a number of ancient samples. And then we can make quantifications of the potential mitochondrial contamination for these samples. I'll just show you one more sample uh, of a method uh, or a simulation study, basically. Um, so, so here's a population model. Um, we imagine that we have an ancient population living in the past. It's split at some point in the past into two groups. And then each of these green and blue dots represents individuals that we've sampled into the past. One of these two groups stopped existing in the past. And here in this case, we simulated 100,000 genetic markers from all of these individuals. And we happen to sample 20 individuals from the present and one from all of these ones in the past. So if we only had access to modern day individuals, these are the 20 individuals that we would have some information about to try to figure out this population history. <coughs> and if you stare at the modern day 20 individuals, they end up uh, in a principal component analysis, contrasted against the time of the sampling in the lower end corner here. And there's no, not much information that you can gain from looking at those 20 individuals. But if you contrast the sample time with something simple as the first principal component in summarizing the genetic variation, you actually quite well recapture the population history of these samples. And you would actually know that there was another population existing in the past that you would have no idea from morphological or from other type of records uh, from these individuals to try to figure out that the history looked like this unless you had access to, to DNA data. So this is one simple simulation example where we actually uh, can see that there's, there's information to be gained by looking into ancient samples. So let's jump into um, some, some results. So I'll start by Scandinavia. Um, and um, I'll describe two studies or three studies that we've done in the recent times where we looked into seven hunter-gatherers from Scandinavia and four farmers from Scandinavia. Some of these one have low coverage, a few percent of the genome, and some of them have one to uh, X coverage of the genomes. Uh, and they're, most of them are about 5,000 years before now, whereas there's one individual who's about 7,500 years old. So first of all, if you just look at the, the sample location, so the hunter-gatherers are from the island of Gotland in the Baltic Sea, and the farmers are from the west coast of Sweden. That's corresponding to the plot that I showed you before, where the hunter-gatherers and farmers were uh, living in the various places in, in Scandinavia. And the, all these other dots are just modern day reference populations that I'm going to be using to try to project the ancient genetic signatures onto uh, this two dimensional map that we can paint from uh, modern day genetic variation. So if we go back and do basically redo the analysis of John de Barbara, all the gray dots here are modern day individuals. So here you have individuals from uh, sampled in the Middle East and, uh, and Caucasus also. Uh, and then you have individuals from southern part of Europe, Sardinia, Tuscany, and then you have individuals from the northern parts of Europe, uh, Orkney Islands, Sweden, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland, and here you have the Swedish Sami, for example. Uh, and if you stare at the, the colorful dots, um, the blue dots and the gray dots, the beige dots, here represents people who have been sampled from a hunting and gathering context. Whereas individuals, the red ones, down here are sampled from a farming context. 
So the first striking pattern here is that there is a quite distinct genetic differentiation between the people who are associated with farming context and those who are as associated with hunting and gathering context. There's quite a bit of population structure between these ones. The farmers are genetically more similar to people who live to today in the southern part of Europe, whereas the hunter-gatherers are somewhat outside the modern-day range of genetic variation uh, in, in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, another kind of side note, if you read back to um, many early 80s and uh, 70s anthropology work, it was claimed that the hunter-gatherers of Scandinavia were actually the predecessors of the northern um, reindeer herding Sami. And that's clearly not the case. Um, the Sami is a much more recent migration event coming into the north of Scandinavia. Um, if we try to contrast this amount of uh, genetic differentiation that we see on the PCA plot uh, into something uh, standard population genetic tools like FST measures, for example, we can measure the amount of genetic variation between modern day groups. And here, these are taken from the Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, the greatest amount of differentiation you have between individuals from Finland and individuals from Tuscany. And they have about this level of, of genetic diversity or, or differentiation uh, measured as FST. And if you look at the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, they have about six times or three times as high level of, um, of genetic differentiation. And if you just pull together all the hunter-gatherers and farmers that were available at that time, um, it looks like it's two to three times almost um, as high differentiation between the hunter-gatherers and farmers. So in the Neolithic times, the differentiation between these groups was actually quite dramatic compared to the modern day range. It's not as great as if you take uh, FST or compute differentiation between people who live today uh, in Europe and people who today live in, in East Asia. It's about halfway there or something like that. Um, we can also take uh, modern day groups and try to look at sharing of alleles with the hunter-gatherers and farmers. So on the y-axis here, I plotted allele sharing with hunter-gatherers. And on the x-axis, I plotted uh, allele sharing with the farmers. And each of these dots here represent modern day individuals. And to some degree, you're going to see that it looks like this kind of a negative cline here. So the more sharing of alleles you have with hunter-gatherers, the less sharing of alleles of farmers you have. So that means that to some degree we can make an hypothesis that we can create modern day groups by pooling uh, a fraction of hunter-gatherer ancestry and a fraction of, uh, of farmer ancestry. And the further north we go, the more hunter-gatherer ancestry we need, and the further south we go, uh, the more uh, farmer ancestry we need. The, the outlier here are modern day people from, from Anatolia. Uh, we can make another analysis and make it quantifiable in a different way. And again, you see that uh, this is where I'm measuring relatedness to the Scandinavian farmer. And uh, you see that there's a decline in geography if you look at the, the range of groups that are indicated here. Even within Sweden, you see that the amount of ancestry related to the farmers are greater in the south, going uh, to a smaller degree when you go to the north. And this is a fun joke in Sweden. People in the south are peasants, so people like me. Uh, I'm from the very south of, of uh, Sweden, and people from Stockholm often call us peasants. And actually, the, the DNA shows that there's some truth to it, although perhaps that's not uh, politically correct to say in these days. Um, we can also look at uh, how these um, relationships between the two groups uh, um, were, how, how did the gene flow? So, so we have the idea now that these two groups mixed and to some degree they created the gene pool that are existing in Scandinavia and other parts of Europe. Uh, and what we see when we compare the hunter-gatherers and farmers directly to each other, you see that the gene flow is not symmetrical. It doesn't look like these two gene pools just existed and then melted together and blended a thousand years later to create the modern day group. It actually looks like genes are flowing from the hunter-gatherers into the farmers. So to some degree, the farming way of life, or at least the farming people, were uh, the sink, whereas the hunter-gatherers were the source uh, in this mixture event. So we can, in other words, we can say that the hunter-gatherers were assimilated uh, by the incoming farmers. 
Um, Johannes will speak much more about uh, this plot. It's from his paper. But I'll just say that you see the same gradients again as I just talked about. So here you have representation of affinities to uh, farmers. Here you have the hunter-gatherers. If you look at modern day groups, you see that there's a clear gradient with modern day groups from the south uh, drawn towards the to the farmers and modern day groups uh, from the north drawn to the hunter-gatherers. And then uh, Johannes will speak about this third component that perhaps represents 5-10% of the ancestry of modern day uh, Europeans. Now I'll jump to uh, a study that we've been doing lately. Uh, we've been looking into an active excavation that's going on in the El Portalon cave. Uh, these are Calcolithic or Copper Age individuals. They're contemporary with the farmers I spoke about in Scandinavia. They're 5,000 5, years uh, old and it's an active excavation um, that's going on over there. And this is a lot of work that Torsten Gunther has been doing. Uh, here he's wearing a helmet. He's visiting the exciting site. And if you see the Mona Lisa smile on him, this is a uh, computational biologist visiting an archaeological site for the first time in his life ever. And I think he carried that Mona Lisa smile for a week after coming back from, from uh, the site. Um, here's a skeleton of a six-year-old uh, male child uh, that was excavated from, from this site. Uh, and the Portalon cave is close to where a Mesolithic individual uh, has been genotyped from, from Iberia also, and I'm including that one including some other published data from Johannes Group and some other uh, individuals that we were going to hear from, uh, from Christina Gamba in a little while, I think. Uh, I'll just kind of give you an overview of what's been done up until at that time when this plot was produced. So these are sampling locations. And the take home message here is that if you take uh, individuals from a hunting and gathering context, regardless of where in Europe they've sampled, they genetically are quite similar to this kind of end of the uh, space of genetic variation. Whereas if you take individuals from a farming context, to a large extent, they all cluster together with individuals who today live in the southern parts of Europe. Yes. Um, so, so we see that this trend is not unique to Scandinavia. It's not unique to any particular part uh, of Europe. It seems to be a trend that's consistent all across Europe. This is another way of saying the same thing. I'll just skip that slide. Uh, and if we look into a little bit more the details of the farmers, we see that the later uh, individuals, so here's three individuals that are a bit younger than these two individuals. And we can see that all of these ones seem to have received more genetic material from hunter-gatherers. So it looks like there's a process going on where you have uh, hunter-gatherers living all across Europe. You have farmers coming in, not mixing very much in the beginning, uh, represented then by individuals who are perhaps 7,000 years old and uh, associated with the LBK context, for example. Whereas then the admixture starts happening and you get these slightly later Neolithic and, uh, and uh, Copper Age individuals and you're starting to see more and more hunter-gatherer gene flow coming into these individuals. And here's just the same thing uh, plotted against time uh, and the amount of ancestry coming from uh, together as, as greater numbers on the TY axis. Last point I wanted to make, um, if you look into the genetic diversity of the farmers, so these red dots represent ancient individuals, all these four groups over there are uh, farmers, and these two are hunter gatherers you see that there's more genetic diversity in the um, farmers than there is in the hunter gatherers So this seems to be consistent all across Europe. Uh, and we can conclude that the affected population size of farmers is greater, and that probably indicates that the census size is also greater. So what can explain this? Well, uh, we can say that perhaps uh, the farmers had a greater carrying capacity. They could actually support larger number of individuals, at least for a sustainable amount of time. And that's also probably affected by that the hunter-gatherers are the descendants of people who lived in, in um, Europe under very harsh conditions during the Ice Ages. So they've been forced through uh, a number of bottlenecks, also reducing the diversity. So both these two patterns probably explain why we see this difference in diversity. So if I just summarize what I've been saying, uh, we're seeing a very dramatic event uh, of mass migration of farmers that partially assimilated uh, hunter-gatherers in Europe. Uh, I think it's one of the uh, most dramatic migration events uh, in Europe. 
Uh, we're seeing lower amounts of genetic diversity from hunter-gatherers, indicating smaller number of individuals or smaller population sizes. We're also seeing that genes actually mirror culture in prehistoric Europe, not geography as it does uh, in modern day times. So let me just try to give you a synthesis of these two contradicting patterns, what I think happened. Um, so I think uh, that we have a pattern of hunter-gatherers living all across Europe at some point in time. Uh, and then you have a more diverse group of farmers coming in and slowly mixing and mixing to uh, greater degrees in the south and more and more being their gene pool being more and more diluted as you come further north. That could actually explain both these types of patterns where you have an isolation by distance pattern with the greatest gradient of diversification along a north-south axis and you also have more diversity in the south and less diversity in the north. So with that, I'll just point out a few people. I've already pointed to Torsten, who worked a lot on the Portolan study. Um, we have Helena Malmström over there, and Emma Svensson, and Aicha Omrak, who's done a lot of the Scandinavian work, and then Pontus Guglund, a former PhD student of mine, who's done a lot of the Scandinavian work also. Uh, and then thanks to a number of funders, and then I'm happy to. Uh, I should also point out to a few collaborators, by the way. So we have um, Christina, uh, who's important for the Portolan study, and Johannes and Svante Pebble, who are important for the contamination uh, study. So with that, uh, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. One question. <laughs> Somebody? Ah, yes. Do any of these migrations relate to the spread of Indo-European languages? Right, so, I mean, that, that's a big debate. There's the Anatolian hypothesis that people actually believe that uh, they were connected to the, the entire um, farming migration out of Anatolia. But there's also the hypothesis that it's coming later, perhaps during the Bronze Age. Um, there's been publications in both directions. Uh, I don't think that these particular patterns say either way. They are perfectly compatible with that Indo-European languages were brought in this time period all across Europe. Um, but I think the other possibility is also compatible with these patterns where it's a later migration. I think we need help of linguists actually trying to combine the work of the genetics, the linguistics, and the archaeology to, to tease these things apart. Okay. If we have time, it, 